think we're about ready to get started. So it's nearly four o'clock and we're stuck in the dungeon. So we're going to talk about memory ordering. I might fall asleep in my own talk. Uh, <laughs> if I do, come and kick me or something and we'll see if we can get to the end of it. <laughs> Who am I? Um, apparently when I present, I do this. So if I start doing this, hopefully I'm not asleep. Uh, I co-maintain a bunch of stuff. Um, the ARM64 architecture with Catlin, and then uh, some other bits and pieces, including the uh, atomics in, in Linux, um, the locking interfaces, the memory model, and recently TLB invalidation as well. So it's kind of grotty concurrent stuff. Uh, and I work, um, <clears throat> I do all that in the open source software group at ARM, where I have a close working relationship with the architecture and technology group, uh, who produce all the sort of um, whiz bang features that get implemented in CPUs. <laughs> and as part of the relationship I've got with them, uh, I helped put together the ARM V8 memory model for the ARM architecture and formalism of that as well. And if that wasn't enough, I also do C++ memory model. Um, well, that's a big committee thing. I have a, a minor role there, but um, I am involved. And last time I spoke at ELC, which was here five years ago for me, uh, I also spoke about memory ordering. So I'm a little bit of a stuck record, uh, perhaps a one-trick pony, but I've modified it a bit to talk about I ordering this time, which is going to be about things like DMA and stuff like that. So to set the scene a little bit, uh, what's my idea of paradise? Um, so this place looks pretty good, um, a tropical desert island. But there's one thing you can do to improve this tropical desert island immensely, and that's to make it a uniprocessor, tropical desert island. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's also an alpha, so it's kind of even better. Uh, don't tell my employer. But um, and that's about as good as my Photoshop skills get. You know, the, the shadows are not quite the right angle, but it, 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 it's great. You know, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, and the reason I like this so much is because you, the complexity and the burden that, that I spend all of my working hours uh, worrying about just goes away. It's, you know, there's, not, there's no peripherals either, right? The grim reality uh, is that we cram thousands of these poor CPUs with no natural light uh, all on a network <laughs> in these air-conditioned warehouses, right? The, the, the island dream is gone. It does not exist. I really wish it did. But this is what we're dealing with. Um, Loads of, like, loads of instances of Linux, and within each uh, instance of Linux, you've got coherency and SMP all over the place. So we, we have to deal with concurrency. We can't have what we wanted. So even with a single coherent shared memory, which is basically what you expect right, when you're writing concurrent code for CPUs. GPU people have a, a, they're a bit more out there with what they have to deal with. But we've got a single coherent shared memory. You, know, you have one copy of a variable, and you're modifying it in a mutable state. Even in that case, concurrency is, is really difficult. Um, <clears throat> reasons that it's difficult, you, you, can't, you can't write your program and then reason about it executing in steps. Because you can have outcomes, I'll show you later, you can have outcomes which don't correspond to a stepwise execution of the program. Because your memory accesses can be reordered, for example. And when your program goes wrong, which is probably rare, but enough that you get told off, or you crash something, you put some instrumentation in, and it starts working, which is the worst kind of bug, Heisenbug. So you, ha you strive for this balance between performance and correctness, because you could put a whopping great big lock around your program, and it'll work, but it's probably not fast enough. And when you go to look at tools to reason about or to, to validate your code, you know, there's, there's not really a concurrent GDB in the sense that you can just connect a debugger, and it says, oh, your race is here. There, there, are, there are things coming along. Um, but it's not the same interactive instant response kind of stuff that you're used to with a single processor. So the CPU is basically not doing what you asked it to do. Can it get worse than this? Well, of course it can, otherwise you wouldn't have a talk. It gets much worse than this. But we'll, we'll go through this bit first, otherwise we're all going to just give up. And I forgot when I did this talk that I can't just go straight to I.O. ordering. We're going to have to do memory ordering first, and so I've had to cram it in five minutes. But let's see how we do. The, the end of the talk is examples, and if we don't get through all of those, it's fine. If you get stuck here, please stop me and I'll do my best. So here's an example called store buffering, and you'll see why it's called that in a minute. So there's two CPUs, uh, and this is sort of kernel code-ish. Um, we've got two shared variables, x and y. They're both zero in memory, uh, initially. And then we've got two local register variables, uh, foo and bar. So each CPU, well, CPU 0 writes 1 to x, and then it reads y into foo, and CPU 1 does the sort of opposite. It writes 1 to y, and then reads x into bar. And the million dollar question is, what are the permissible values for foo and bar? Because you, you could run this program many times, right? And depending on 
which CPU may goes a bit quick, quicker than the other, or the order in which things propagate, you know, you may get different outcomes. So does anyone want to have a guess at a permissible outcome? All of them, correct, yes, congratulations. So that's, that's why that's a good question, right? Because whatever you said, I could have said yes. Um, and all, all production architectures will permit the, the perhaps counterintuitive uh, result here, which is that foo and bar can be zero. Um, and I can show you that if you want. We've got a little bit of time. Ignore this. This is cryptic gobbledygook from academics. So there's the test uh, in x86 assembly. You can see there's, it's only four instructions. And I can just, this is a memory model toolkit. Um, I can actually run that on my laptop a million times. Okay, and for some reason, it, whoop, 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 let's go back to that. For some reason, it prints out CPU info at the end, so we just do scroll up past all of that. It's always the same. Well, hey, okay, so now you can see uh, what we saw. So we ran it uh, 10 million times, and there are the four outcomes. And we did actually see all four on my laptop just then while I was running it. Um, so yes, you were correct, and my laptop agrees with you. So let's try and get back to the slides. There we are. Good. So now you believe me. I'm not making it up. How? Anyone got an idea how? The clue's in the name of the test. Well done. <laughs> so it's store buffering. And the thing is that you, you, these right ones here basically sit in the local store buffers, and the local store buffers are not snooped by other CPUs. So when the other CPUs do their, when the CPUs do their corresponding read, that variable has not yet been updated in terms of it's not yet made visible to other people. And that looks a bit like the read and the write get reordered on each core. And the reason this is counterintuitive to, to some people is because there's this uh, memory model called sequential consistency, which says that your program has to run stepwise um, so that the concurrent execution of the program looks like an interleaving of the threads. <clears throat> so I've labeled the four statements here, A, B, C, and D, and what you're allowed to do, basically, is come up with interleavings as long as the order they are in the program is preserved. So A always has to be before B, and C always has to be before D. Uh, and there's some example interleavings. And that's easy to reason about, quote unquote. There's lots of you know, concurrency modeling toolkits which are built upon SC. And the big problem with SC, which is symmetric consistency, is it forbids the zero outcome in the previous example. So it gives you this concurrent toolkit and a, a memory model that's quote unquote easy to reason about, but it's just, it's not applicable to the real world because nobody builds SC machines, or at least there are no SC architectures out there. And you saw that on my laptop. So that's a problem. So people have, um, some people have realized this is an issue and they've come up with ways to reason about weak memory behavior. So that's non-SC behaviors, i.e. the zero zero case that we've been talking about. And one way you can talk about those is with these very cryptic things called litmus tests, which also have cryptic names. So I'm going to explain to you the structure of the litmus test um, so you get an idea for what they are. So this one is called MP, MP plus popple plus po. Ignore that bit. We just call it MP. That stands for message passing. OK. Ignore this next line. Uh, it's an AH64 assembly. And this part here between the curly braces is setting up our shared memory. So everything is zero at the start of time. That's just an implicit assumption of a litmus test. And we have two variables, x and y. So it says on CPU zero, that's what that zero is, zero colon, register x1 is x. And what that actually means is it's a pointer to x. But the, the syntax here doesn't have the ampersand. But there's a pointer to x in register x1, and there's a pointer to y in register x3. And over here, it's uh, CPU one, x1 has a pointer to y, and x3 has a pointer to x. So that's, we've got our registers, they've got pointers to variables, shared variables. And then you have the test here, which is the, oh, sorry, the program here. And the program here, you've got P0, processor zero, and P1, processor one. They execute concurrently, they execute at the same time. And they run these instructions. So this guy moves one into this register, W0, and then stores it to X1, which has a pointer to X. So actually, if you draw this, it looks a bit like this. So we do thread zero, which is P0 here, there's write x equals one, write y release, because this is a special kind of order inducing store, to be one. And this guy over here reads y and reads x here. And the constraint at the bottom 
constrains the values that these registers can hold. So x0 is the same as w0 for the, the purpose of this example. It's just the 64-bit view of that register. And with that knowledge, with that exists clause, uh, you can create this reads from arrow and this thing called a from read arrow, which I don't have time to go into. But what you've got is you, you write x, you write y. This guy reads y. Is it allowed to read x equals 0? So if you think of this as data and flag, you know, you write the data, you set the flag. This guy sees the updated flag. Does it see the old data? That's kind of a weak memory question, which you could ask. And you, you can run that through a tool, and it will tell you the answer. The thing to remember, this is the, basically the takeaway that I want you to have, is that you've got a cycle here. And cycles are bad. And whether or not you need to worry about a cycle is determined by the memory model. And that's kind of memory models in five minutes. And that's the easy case. Don't worry. <laughs> I don't think I've got any more limit tests. So I haven't checked. I don't think I have. So we can take this beyond shared memory communication. So we're already, most of the research out there for concurrency is dealing with sequential consistency. There's a whole bunch of people doing weak memory consistency. And I don't really know of anything going on in this area, which is unfortunate because you need it for an operating system. Not all communication between observers, threads, CPUs, is via explicit accesses to shared memory. So <clears throat> imagine this case here, which is a slight change of the previous one. If we write x equals 1, and then instead of writing to y, we write to an interrupt controller, which triggers an interrupt on thread 1, and then it reads the old x. OK, now there's no cycle here. So memory model, like classical memory model logic says, well, that's fine. Linux may not like this. Um, probably be quite bad. So we need a way of talking about these kind of tests, which doesn't really exist. And it's not just interrupts. There's a whole bu a bunch of other ways you could do it. So it could be DMA from a peripheral. It could be updates to a page table. You can even have weird things like regulators, where you power on a regulator and then try to access the thing that's been powered on. You will need to make sure that that happens in the right order. And most people go, that's all out of scope. No one does this. But of course, yeah, Linux does this all the time. <laughs> it's, it's because it's difficult. Uh, and it's already hard enough that I think people don't want to go that, that extra mile. So what I want you to think about is we can generalize the idea of a shared coherent memory just a little bit. So we can generalize this. So the inter, inter process of communication, we consider it as accesses to endpoints. So an access is, a, and I'm saying, this is, this is something I've come up with for this talk. You know, there are other ways you can look at this. It's just how I think about it. So an access is an event targeting a specific endpoint, which causes it to change state. Um, so that could be, you know, in the memory case, that could be a write to memory. <laughs> um, I suppose it may cause it to change state, because a read probably doesn't for memory. And an endpoint is a piece of hardware with a mutable state, which can respond to accesses. And then maybe it can also generate other accesses, like accessing a DMA engine, which then accesses memory. Here are some modern endpoints. <laughs> so for us, for, for Linux, it, we, we don't quite need this generalization as far as I'm explaining it here. We really just need to care about memory or MMIO. And when I say MMIO, it's, it's IO mem pointers. It's stuff that you get back from IO remap is what we're considering. So it's that and it's memory. And we'll just consider all accesses to be load store operations via the appropriate accesses in Linux. So it's things like readl and writel, which I'm going to talk more about. There are also peripherals that have perhaps funny system register interfaces, but I'm not going to go into that either. So I'm kind of limiting the scope a bit for this talk, but the same kind of idea applies. And then once you've got sort of that in your head, uh, we need to distinguish one other thing, which is ordering versus completion. So the way I like to think of this is ordering requires that two accesses to the same endpoint will remain in order on their way to that endpoint. So in this funny picture here, You've got CPU 0, which has done access A, and then it's done access B. And these are going towards this endpoint here. So in this case, uh, you know, perhaps they are ordered, perhaps. And that means that everyone's always going to see them in order. And as they propagate down here towards the endpoint, you know, B is not allowed to overtake A. They have to remain in order. And that might be because you put a barrier between them, or it might be because of memory type or whatever. And CPU, CPU 1 will see them both in order because of that. Because it doesn't hold anything up, right? It just punts them out, and they propagate in order. <laughs> so completion, on the other hand, requires a prior access to reach a certain point before it can initiate a later access. So uh, for reads, we say that reads complete when they have their data. So they appear to complete at the endpoint. You know, if you're reading from 
a memory or a, a peripheral, you, you can't you can't satisfy the read until it's completed. It's going to go somewhere, it's going to pick up its value, then we say it's completed. And then after that, you know, that reads now complete, we can do something else. For writes, they can actually be buffered, even merged, and they can complete early, like for example on a posted write. So here, if A was a write, it might complete at this buffer, and now we can do B. So in this case, we're saying we have to complete A, and then we can do B. So completion sort of implies ordering, but you can also use completion to achieve the effects of ordering to different endpoints, and that's what we're going to talk about for the, for the um, Linux IO accesses. So, yep, let's go on to the API, which I can't do. The, one of the big problems with IO ordering uh, is it really is it's like a melting pot of lots of different memory models. So you, you might have the CPU memory model, which is perhaps the architecture memory model. Um, and then that might interface to an interconnect which has an internal memory model which isn't programmer visible. And then someone has to bridge that to a, another bus like PCI where, which does have a programmer visible memory model. And because all of these things have their own memory model and it's, a lot of it's at the mercy of the hardware integrator to get this right, uh, it can be really complicated. And, and it means you can build systems that are broken. You could in theory integrate a system where you cannot interact with the PCI memory model from software point of view because the thing in the middle just well, doesn't play ball. So Linux kind of has to assume some basic sanity here. And yeah, correct bridging is crucial. So the two things we need to consider really is DMA buffers, which are allocated via DMA alloc coherent, or maps using the streaming API. Um, so Linux has that interface, and it makes an assumption about the coherence of devices. So a device is either DMA coherent or it's not. We don't have a middle ground where, oh, it's coherent for these types of things up to this point. It's just coherent or it's not coherent. And MMI regions are mapped using IO remap. Um, that requires aligned accesses when you make them. It gives you some access size guarantees. Uh, it guarantees that you don't speculate things. There are some funny versions of IO remap, like IO remap WC which is weaker, and I remap no cache, which is stronger. The semantics of these are pretty vague. They're very driven by x86. If, you, if you're going to start using I remap WC or no cache in your driver, watch out, because there's a good chance you won't have portable correctness, or you might not be correct across different architectures in those cases. But we're going to just concentrate on I remap really for this. So here are the default IO accesses. So any of you who've written a kernel driver has probably used at least some of these. So you've got your IOMM star back from uh, IO remap, and you want to dereference it. Well, you can't just blindly dereference it because everything will go wrong. The compiler won't realize what it is, and who knows what will happen. You might break the machine, or at least crash. So you use a special accessor. So there's these in X, out X, so in B, you know, is, is for reading. For, that's a legacy x86 port IO access instruction, but we have an API for it. Um, on other architectures, it will be a memory mapped thing under the hood, but that's what they are. We also have read X and write X, so read L, write L, things like that, for accessing explicitly mapped MMIO. And then you can use IO read 32, IO write 32, those kind of things, which expand to the correct accessor based on what the device is, is under the hood. And these are the default accessors. They pretty much always do what you want, but they can be quite expensive, and I'll talk about that in a minute. They're a little endian by default, and they're ordered against other accesses to the same endpoint. So if you do two write Ls to a given MMIO region that you IO remapped, they will be ordered to that IO region, which is often a desirable property. You can push writes by doing a read back. So if you write L and then read L back, the, the write L is going to have to reach the endpoint before your read can come back. And here's the bit which makes it really, really, comp really, really expensive for non-x86, which is that write accessor initiates after completing prior memory writes. So if you remember that what completion means, that means that your memory writes that are before the write accessor have to go all the way out to memory and be visible. And depending on your coherency, that could be a different point. But you've got to push everything out. You're at least going to have to drain your store buffer. <laughs> and then you can initiate the, the write access to the device. But only then. You can't do it earlier. And similarly for reads, the read accessor completes um, before initiating later memory reads. And it also is ordered with respect to later delay loops as well. Not currently on ARM. I'm fixing that which was a patch that came out of writing this presentation. Um, so this is kind of, the reason it's, it's, it's designed like this 
is because if you're interacting with a device that's done DMA, it kind of makes sense, right? So you write, so you, so you want to transmit some data, you write into the DMA buffer, and then you write to the device saying, please DMA my, the, the, my buffer, the stuff I just wrote to memory. Well, your write is going to give you that guarantee because it's ordered with respect to those. It completes them, I should say. You can do some crazy stuff with spin locks using this. Just try not to do it. It's very complicated. <laughs> um, on non-x86, this is really expensive. I keep saying that. So what do we do? Uh, because in the cases where you don't care about ordering memory accesses, uh, you don't want to pay this price. <laughs> well, you can chill out. We've got relaxed accesses. Um, <laughs> they're actually quite heavily used because that performance burden is, is so high. <laughs> so we, we don't have them for everything. We have them for read L and write L kind of style accesses, write L relaxed, read L relaxed, which are just for these accesses here. And also for these string variants with the S or the rep. So the, the idea of these string accesses uh, that it's when you're um, reading from a, a memory map FIFO, something like that. So you don't actually care about memory accesses at all. It's just endpoint accesses. So you don't need ordering there. You don't need completion guarantees. So these don't provide any completion guarantees. But what they do provide is that they remain ordered to the same endpoint. And people forget that. So I think there are quite a lot of cases where you're not worried about DMA, but you want to make sure your accesses uh, arrive at the endpoint in order. That's still guaranteed for the relaxed accesses. And in hindsight, maybe relaxed wasn't such a good name because it really makes them sound like you can't rely on anything. And you can. You've still got that order to the same endpoint. Practically, they probably also work with spin locks. But yeah, if your machine crashes, don't blame me. <laughs> uh, so mandatory barriers. So what you can do is you can, if you need to be explicit about the ordering and the fences that you want, you can use the mandatory barriers. And you can even use them in conjunction with the relaxed accesses if you were, I don't know why you'd do that. Maybe it's useful to do sometimes. So we've got three of those. They're a bit like the SMP barriers without the prefix. So MB completes prior reads and writes before it initiates later reads and writes. And this is for all different endpoints and, and memory. Right? And then for RMB, it's just reads to reads. And WMB, it's writes to writes. They're fairly straightforward. If you ever add one of these, please put a comment there, because it's impossible to read code that just has these willy-nilly. You just can't remove them. Um, so if you use them in conjunction with the relaxed accesses, for example, write L basically behaves like a WMB and then a write L relaxed. And that's pretty much how we implement it on M64. And this WMB is expensive. And then this is just another example. If, if you wanted to order or complete a write before initiating a read, you have to use an MB because write L doesn't do that. And that's the only way you can have write to read ordering here. But if you're doing normal DMA with a sane device, you generally don't need these. You can use the, 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 the four accesses. <laughs> Good. Uh, so another type of uh, ordering mechanism we have, uh, DMA barriers. Now, these are actually quite a lot different. These are only intended to be used for DMA alloc coherent allocations. And they only provide ordering for um, memory accesses memory accesses, and they're much, much, much cheaper than all of the other fences. So a common use for these, in fact, the only use I've really seen, is where you have a coherent descriptor ring. Uh, and maybe a device is doing DMA of descriptors, which have a payload and a valid flag. And you want to read the valid flag and then read the payload. And you can use, for example, a DMA RMB to order those reads. Uh, no effect on IOMM access, and uh, they're relatively cheap. So yeah, if, if you're writing a coherent uh, DMA ring, um, the, the read side of that. Just, just use DMA RMB. Don't use RMB. DMA RMB is much, much quicker. And I think it's quicker on x86 as well. So let's go through some examples. I went through the uh, kernel source code to try and find examples of uses of these. So the slides are available if you ever want to go back and have a look. And actually, in doing this, I found bugs in code I'd written. Um, so <laughs> I don't know what that says about the API, but uh, at least I, I've now documented it, and I have patches. So. So here's, here's an example. This was one a case where I actually got it right. It's my, my favorite driver because I wrote it. Um, submitting a command to the SMMU. So the SMMU, is, it's an ARM IOMMU, and it has a, a memory map queue. So we've got this queue right here, and we're basically just copying from something in memory to a DMA buffer. So this is a DMA alloc coherent in memory buffer. So we copy the stuff in. <laughs> That's a bunch of stores. Uh, and then we're going to do this little bit of weird maths because it's a queue and then a write L to update the memory mapped, um, so it's probably here, to, to update the memory mapped uh, register, say, hey, there's some new stuff in the queue. So you need to make sure that what you wrote to the memory map queue is 
uh, completed before you write to the device, which is why you need a write L. So that's a classic example of where you need to use write L. So here's another example, and I'm not very, I don't know much about networking, and this didn't all fit on a slide, so I had to trim things down a bit. <laughs> but we have uh, this, this Ethernet driver here for reading Rx data. So there's a, a function here called mvregread, which is basically just a readle. I think it might be a hash defined to readle. So just treat that as a readle. I ran out of slide. Um, and we do a, uh, we call that this mvnetter rusku busy desk non get, which is here. So that's our readle to find out how much stuff is there. How much stuff is there in my uh, receive queue? How many descriptors do I have? And once we know, uh, we basically get something out of there, and then we need to do a mem copy here. And this mem copy has to be uh, ordered because it's a reading from the queue with respect to when we find out how many um, uh, descriptors there are. So we've got to complete these guys. Now you might think, well, hang on a minute. There's a sort of a dependency here in some sense because this Rx to do forms part of the condition of the while loop. So maybe that's enough to give us ordering. And it's actually not because the CPU can speculate this, these loads here in the mem copy in theory. So you could still have an issue. So you do need to use write L, no, read L there. Sorry, you can't use read L relaxed. So it's like the opposite of the previous example. We're doing a read of the register and then a read of the, the memory. So here's, you know, I've, I've just given you two examples why you should never use the relaxed accessors, which is not what I want. So let's, let's move on to the relaxed accessors. Here is a, a driver. Again, I've had to trim it down a bit to keep it on the slide. But basically what it's doing is it's setting up um, the parameters for a DMA in MMIO registers. So there's a whole bunch of stuff. It's a display driver, which is another thing I know nothing about. But um, this has got a memcon, which needs to be started, then an address and a pitch. Uh, and then this GMC setting zero is the thing that actually says, right, go and do the DMA using the parameters I just gave you. So actually, the parameters themselves, we don't care. We can use relaxed here because we just need to make sure they're ordered with respect to this guy. And if you remember, relaxed accesses are ordered to the same endpoint. But the final write L, which uh, triggers the DMA, that needs to be ordered with respect to um, prior memory writes. Or it needs to complete them, I should say. I keep getting the technology wrong. People tend to get this wrong, and you'll see WMBs littered over here, which is probably worse than just using write L for everything, because it, it makes the code more confusing. So you, you don't need WMBs in this case. This is, this is perfectly fine. This will work. OK. You might not recognize this file, because it's not in mainline. Uh, unfortunately, it is in the Ubuntu kernel package, because they apparently ship a special kernel for this SOC, which is suboptimal. And this, this uh, file brings up the L2 and initializes the Snoop control unit, which is questionable whether Linux should be doing this. So take, take a deep breath, because this is a marvel of code. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure these are all documented. And we could probably just figure out where the bug is. But there is a bug here, and it's actually quite a cryptic bug. Um, and I do need to fix Linux. That's another thing. The, the ARM64 port doesn't, doesn't quite get this right either. <laughs> and the issue is we're, we're doing a right L relaxed to apparently deassert this reset with these magic values. Then there's an MB. <laughs> then we have to wait for 54 microseconds um, and then turn this thing on. And assumingly, this is critical. Otherwise, this somehow hasn't had an effect. I have no idea. But the problem is, this, this can uh, complete early, as I showed in those diagrams earlier on. Right? There's, there's no guarantee here that this has actually had an effect. It might be buffered. So this U delay here, we, the CPU can wait 54 microseconds. The device might still not have seen this. And then this can go and join it in the buffer, and then you can see them both at the same time. So there's no guarantee that uh, the device is going to see the, the delay here. Anyone got an idea how you would fix this? Exactly. So you read, put a read back here, uh, which is going to force that guy to come out and go all the way to the endpoint. Then you can do your wait, and then you can do this. I'm going to fix it, and then that will also work on uh, ARM64. It currently does work on power, and it does work on x86. And it seems that actually th this is quite a common pattern for people to do an access to an MMIO and then spin for a bit. Um, but like, like I said, don't worry, it's not in mainline, so I'm sure this is done by some reliable firmware instead. So another thing, uh, use of the DMA uh, MB. So this one is great because they put a comment in. So whoever wrote this code, thank you very much. This was a joy to read. Just found it very easily. <laughs> so we're, it's in an InfiniBand driver. 
It's in a tasklet, polling this notification queue, and there's a budget, basically, of how many things we're going to try and pull out of this queue. And there's two bits we do. So we, we grab something out of the queue and check, is it valid? If it's not valid, we just skip. Uh, we're done. And if it is valid, we go, oh, great, it was valid. So now we can go and actually access the stuff in the buffer, uh, the, the payload part, I should say. And we need to make sure that we don't speculatively load the payload. Um, then the thing becomes valid, and we think that we saw the valid payload. We need ordering between checking valid and reading the payload, and you can do that with a DMA RMB, and this is a good example of that. So this is another one of my favorite drivers. I'm of course, lying. <laughs> this is the smc 911 xc and if you, haven't, if you haven't encountered this driver, you haven't lived. Um, so this, uh, this has some nice wrappers. Um, for these functions. So we've got a receive and a send, which for some reason have got different style of naming. And, but they, they expand to these macros. Well, they use these macros. So there's a pull data and a push data, um, which is another way of saying reading and writing data. And, and you can see how these macros are then defined in terms of in SL and in out SL, which then eventually go to the I write 32 rep and I read 32 rep. They're using the string accesses. And this particular piece of hardware can be built and very often is built without any DMA capability. So the way that you uh, get data out, or get data in from it, I should say. There's just an MMIO register, and you read it, um, and you get 32 bits of, of packet, and then you read it again, and you get the next 32 bit, and you just keep reading, and if you can't read it fast enough, it all goes wrong. Uh, and similar for sending stuff out. Um, so that's what these macros are doing. And in that case, you really don't care about any memory ordering, um, as long as you're getting the stuff out of the FIFO in order, and that's guaranteed by the, uh, the string accesses. So that's why we use them there. So it is actually, once you untangle all of the preprocessor, uh, it's actually a reasonable example. <laughs> so I'm pretending to offer a 100-pound reward because there is a rumor um, that some Adaptech card is rumored to do DMA on a read. So you read a register, and then it does a DMA, which is a bit weird. Uh, it's not, I don't really, it doesn't make any sense why you would build hardware like this, because reads are quite expensive, because you actually have to complete at the endpoint. I couldn't find anything in the tree, but there's a lot of code in the tree. Um, and all I have is this some Adaptech card, and I don't think it's a very new card. So in theory, to, to fix this and make sure it works, you'd require an explicit MB before the MMIO read. So if you find it, um, you can come and claim your 100 pound reward, and I'll probably not give it to you. But, have a look. It'd be great. If, let me know if you find any examples, because this will, this will not work without the MB. So maybe your reward is actually you have to write a patch to add the MB. OK, any questions? Oh, and thanks to Arne and Ben for helping me reverse engineer the semantics of these APIs. That's it. Questions? <laughs> and if you have a question, you have to come up to the front. And there's a mic there and a mic there. If you want your tropical island with non-SMP platform, you might not want to bring it alpha out of all of them, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. The, the alpha, it, it started off well. <laughs> and another comment on the whole, um, maybe you don't want to bring that up in, firm, in, in Linux on the, on the L2 cache config. Oh, yeah. Um, I know it's a complicated subject, but at least we see the mess now. The code would be the same in firmware. It wouldn't yep. be fixed, but yeah. <laughs> That's true. Um, there's quite a lot going on, obviously, to have open source firmware now. Uh, but the incentive is perhaps not as strong as having an open source operating system. There's, there's not as much to get back from it. Um, so you're right. At least we can see the code and we can reason about it. And as I say, even if they fix that code, there's actually an underlying bug uh, in our back end, which I'm now going to fix. So it was useful for that. You're right. Yep. Thanks for your talk. Could you show slide number 25 once again, please? Oh, by me, what did I do? This one? Yeah. Uh, if I understood you right, you said that MB here is not enough, or is it a bug? <coughs> um, yeah, so the, uh, let's have a look here. So the problem is, yeah, so MB is going to force this guy to complete. Um, but if you remember the completion diagram I showed, you can complete earlier, because a posted write, for example. <laughs> so when you complete this write here, the device, this L2 base thing, might still not see it. There could be a buffer, a hardware buffer, before that device. So all it means is that this guy's guaranteed to have got into that buffer, 
but it, at, at that point, it's not able to affect any state change on the, the L2 base, this, this power control here. Um, so then you wait this 54, then this guy can also go and sit in the buffer, and then perhaps they both go out together, and you see one cycle at the endpoint between the two writes, which probably isn't what they're, they're going for here. I mean, it also might work fine, and given that this is SOC specific, it might work fine on that SOC. I'm just trying to use an example for, this was the only one I, uh, I found this by chance when I was looking to see what this file was. Um, and it's, yeah, not the correct use of the, the API. <laughs> this, this code's probably never and, had as many example, people look at it. Is there actually <laughs> anything preventing us from speculating the U-delay even before the write out starts? So it depends. If the, if the U-delay is backed by a memory mapped timer, then the MB will hold it up. If it's backed by a system register read, then actually probably not. I, I was thinking of the classical loop a million times implementation. <laughs> yeah, and if that doesn't contain any loads or stores. Um, basically, basically, any memory access is going to be held up by that MB. Um, but but U-Delay doesn't do any memory access in the AAA implementation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we could just do the U-Delay even before we do the write L and the re read L and the memory barrier. <laughs> you, might, you might run into trouble with... Because um, you'll, you'll get a... Oh, let me think about this. It's quite complicated. You, the, the, the backwards control loop might stop that. I have to have a think about it. It certainly can go wrong. You, you, need the, you need that read L, and we have to put some magic in the read L to make sure that we hold up stuff, probably using a fake control dependency, which is based on a trick from PowerPC, actually. Uh, another question, not about this slide. Does IOVs affect uh, when uh, writes complete or not? For example, on all your examples, you use 32-bit writes, right? Mm -hmm. And if you, for example, inter interleave them with 16 bits or byte writes, mm -hmm. does it affect somehow? So if you, you mean if you, this was like a, a series of write Bs or something? Uh, not, not a series, but interleaved, for example. If you go to that slide where you have three writes uh, L relaxed and one write L uh, at the yeah. end. Yeah, I think it was probably just the wrong. This, this one. one, yeah. yeah. So for you're example, saying if, if, if the second one will be write B. <laughs> okay, so that's still okay. So actually, if you look at these, whilst they're using the same base, these are all different offsets. So all you need is to make sure that they're accessing the, the same device, and then you'll have order. They don't have to, the, the actual uh, underlying addresses do not need to overlap. And you'll still get, still get the order there. Okay, I think I'm about done. So cheers. Oh, no, there's one more. <laughs> I'll come and find you. <laughs>